Hi there, if this is your first video, my name is Raylan and I have a really incredible, amazing interview for you today. It's one of my all time favorites. It's with a gentleman named Daniel von Losbroek. He's over in the Netherlands and his story is just so inspiring. He went from being so sick with severe ME-CFS, being bed bound, relying on other people to feed him, at times not being able to even open his eyes to where he is now which is healthy and thriving and just doing incredible. And if you haven't already subscribed to my channel, I invite you to consider subscribing. Over the next couple of months, I've got some really exciting stuff coming up. I've got interviews with doctors and specialists, and I have some videos talking about some cutting edge healing modalities. So by subscribing, you ensure that you are not gonna miss out on any of this. Plus, it's a nice way to say thank you to me and it will make me happy. And what really makes me happy is that by getting more subscribers, it makes the YouTube algorithm happy, which means that YouTube will put these videos out in front of more people who might need this information, people who might be struggling and in need of a little bit of hope and inspiration themselves. Hey, Daniel, I'm so excited to have you here with me today. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this and to, to talk with me and with everyone on my channel. Thank you, Raylan. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Yeah, so let's let's just dive right in. So we're here obviously to talk a bit about your health journey. So can you tell us a bit about about your story? Well, that's a big story actually. I think I I was my chronic fatigue syndrome started I was how do you say this properly? I think my journey to chronic fatigue syndrome was a very long journey, but it was inevitable and it started way back in childhood, but it only manifested itself when I was uh, 30 years old. And um Sometimes when I coach people, uh, they ask me, how was it for you? How was it your life for you? And then I can talk, you know, in retrospect, I can look back at the things that led to me developing chronic fatigue syndrome. And then they, because, you know, I, I label it now. I can label it this traumatic event and this happened and this stress addiction. And then they, they talk about, well, but my life is not so traumatic. It's, 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 I, I live a very, I've lived a very normal life. So. I, if for every, for anyone who is who is watching, I would like to, to you know to, to, to that they have that in mind that uh, maybe um, the lives that we thought that were normal was not really normal, and that chronic fatigue syndrome was already developing a long time. As a child, I I sort of always had the urge to impress people, and. I always felt that there was something missing in my life. And I come from a place where there was not a lot of emotional connection with, with, with people possible. I was bullied at school. So I was always trying to perform at yeah, more than 100%, always being on, trying to, to, to feel people and to see what they need, to see if they can like me, more or less. It's, it's sort of a traumatic wound to, 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 to develop a tendency to please other people or to impress other people. And I was also very um, different than other people. And so I, I finished school very early on. And as soon as I was 18 years old and allowed to leave the country, I uh, started roaming around the world and working in different hotels. But I, I always had this urge to perform. So I was working first as an 18 year old, uh, as, a, as an entertainer in a hotel. But that led to me being a comedian eventually always going on stages and trying to make people laugh. And then I developed dinner shows, uh, huge shows where everybody was being entertained. And I always wanted more, more people, more money. And I, when in the end, I, I finally earned so much money that I, I realized that everything that I ever wanted was I was having at that moment. But it wasn't what I was really looking for. And the final year before uh, chronic fatigue syndrome, I, I broke up with my ex-girlfriend and that was very emotional for me. Mm. And after two days of crying, I, I decided, you know, that's enough. Uh, I have to move on. And this wasn't the right, right relationship for me anyway. And then those days following that, uh, I noticed that it was harder for me to relax. And just like everybody with chronic fatigue syndrome, I, I had a problem with you know the parasympathetic nervous system to stay in the relaxed mode so I was always always uh, in the stress mode so to speak but I couldn't really relax anymore and I was always working trying to get more and more 
and uh, and then eventually when I had worked so hard and achieved everything that I always wanted as a child that I thought that would bring me safety and connection and and recognition probably I noticed that I had a, abused myself and there over th for over 30 years I had really abused myself and uh, I felt guilt for doing that then at the same moment someone came to me and gave me this drug it was uh, ecstasy or MDMA and it was in Amsterdam so that's a logical place for it and some some voice in, in me said to me like take it so I so I took it and uh, I didn't like it at all I went I, w I went home immediately I felt weird fell asleep and the next morning I wanted to try my exercise rut routine and I just couldn't and uh, I, I already noticed in the weeks before that I couldn't really I wasn't really as strong as before because I was always doing extreme sports, uh, extreme muscle building, mountain biking, kite surfing. Uh, it, it was, there was this workout called Insanity that I used to do, uh, which was a little bit insane. And uh, and I, I and then from that day on, I, I just couldn't. I c could hardly walk the stairs, and uh, that was uh, yeah how it sort of began to me. Thank you so much for sharing all of that, Daniel. I it's, it's so interesting hearing how this comes on for, for so many different people. And your story is obviously unique, but it also reminds me of different people that I've interviewed as well, different elements of just this coming to a, it, it, it almost doesn't feel like what should be a trigger for an illness onset, you know, like, oh, I just, I realized I wasn't happy or my life wasn't in line with what I actually wanted to be living. And I think these are things that we haven't been socialized or brought up to take seriously as having impacts on our health. But you brought up a good point. You know, my therapist talks about like big T trauma and little T trauma. And I think most of us think of trauma as things like you went to war or you you were, you know, physically attacked or mm -hmm. something like that. But we, we do have we do have all of us have traumas in our life. We I think we just don't recognize them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So and, uh, So what happened from there? So you took ecstasy, um, which did not live up to its name <laughs> at all. <laughs> 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 no, it was terrible. And you woke um, up in your so. What did you think the next day when you woke up and you couldn't exercise? You couldn't do all these things. What, what did you think was happening? Uh, I, I didn't know, but I was. I felt it felt it felt terrible, and um, at the same time, I didn't want to give into it. You know, I had this positive mindset. You know, whatever I ignore will go away. <laughs> so I ignored it for uh, six months, and uh, in that time, I actually uh, developed brain fog. And I couldn't really work full time anymore. So it started, you know, first four days a week, then three days a week and two days a week and two and then two half days a week. And then after work, just completely exhausted in bed. At the same time, I sort of I don't really remember how it went, but I got a new girlfriend somehow. But I had so much brain fog that I couldn't really remember my own name. At times, I couldn't really remember how to go home. Wow. And and then I I just had to uh, admit that I was very sick, and uh, I think that process took me six seven months uh, or something. Wow. Yeah. And and that I think denial is the same with emotions, you know, because I I was somehow was I was influenced by this two thousand and six movement, The Secret, mm -hmm. you know, with positive thinking. That you know, like oh no, that's negative. Let's let's ignore that. And yeah. but then I was sort of under hypnosis in the belief that, that that there are so also negative things inside of me like emotions that i should ignore like anger guilt fear uh, shame uh, pride you know all these so-called negative emotions and so i just swallow them all and that was also a part of the uh of, of what i what i found out back then is that I came uh, across this, this this woman on YouTube. She, her name was Teal Swan, about emotional healing. And I thought, okay, seven months ill, I'm going to change it. I'm going to do this, this this emotional purging. And I started really ambitious, but again, that was again too crazy because I, everything came up almost, and that was so overwhelming that it didn't take long for me to uh, to be completely at rock bottom from there on. Yeah. So the work you started doing 
around the emotional healing actually made you worse initially. Yes. Yeah. It's uh, I th right now. I think emotional healing is a, it takes a very important role, but little drips every day, a little drip, not one day, completely the whole day in bed, trying to cry out <laughs> old childhood wounds and old things. Like I was literally doing it for six hours a day. And uh, it is, it's so it's, it's, it was crazy. Yeah. So yeah. that's such a good point. And that's something I haven't thought about our, you know, our mental health that way or our emotional healing. Cause you know, with our physical stuff, we say, you know, be careful and we wouldn't do too much all at once because we know our body can't handle it. You know, we're not going to do all these different cleanses and medications and, you know, it's just going to be too much. But I think yeah. with our mental health, there's so much that we just don't take seriously and we just think, okay, well, it's just, it's, it'll be fine. I can, I can dive in for six hours a day, you know, I can handle it. But <laughs> it's just appreciating that, yeah. like that mind-body connection, right? It, it really does have a physical impact on you. Yeah, I think one hour already. And I noticed that later on in recovery because emotional healing is not never really finished. And uh, if, if, if I, I, well, actually, I haven't had, I haven't had anything emotionally uh, in around a year right now. But in the end, sometimes I had this emotional experience for only one hour. And I noticed that it took me three or four days, sort of a minor crash to recover from that one hour of emotional purging because it's just very stressful. One of, the, one of the many interesting things that you shared that I'm curious about uh, and unique things that I haven't heard before is that you seem to pretty quickly go this route. Like most people go straight into the physical symptoms and you know go to their doctor. Like, did you go to a doctor or what made you not go that more traditional route of like, I should go see what pill or surgery I need? And I, I, I remember, uh, I think it was a few years before chronic fatigue syndrome and and I was, I was already like looking into pharmaceuticals and how they actually do sometimes more harm than they help. Mm. And I was already thinking like, uh, well, if I ever develop cancer, I'm going to heal myself. I'm going to do it. And, and I already had the feeling that it was sort of emotional, that that could help. So I was very naive, of course. So. <laughs> Yeah, that's how I uh, thought I was going to know better than everybody else. Just like I uh, always had that. I was sort of a know-all. And uh, and anyway, the doctor uh, sent me away. And uh, and I went back to doctors later on when I there was a time that I could not speak anymore. I could not get up out of bed anymore. Uh, sort of the, the most frightful image of chronic fatigue syndrome where you can't open your eyes. Uh, that happened to me. And then I went to doctors and still they ignored me or laughed at me. And uh, it was just not a helpful path to go there. Wow. Can you walk us through a little bit of like when it got to its worst for you? What did that look like? What did your average day or week look like for you? Yeah, well, that was, uh, I had to give up my house at the end of 2016 after one and a half year of chronic fatigue syndrome. Uh, my co I had to give up my company and then I stopped completely everything and this new girlfriend that I had uh, well we broke up because it wasn't anything actually but then I was alone and spending in the, in the house of my stepdad and in the beginning I was sort of excited to to really rest but I that at, at that moment I really stopped and then all the stress really came up in me and uh that was a very disturbing. I wanted to distract myself from all the stress. And the more I did that, the more exhausted I got. And after a few months, I, I just couldn't really get out of bed anymore. And then this doctor in the area, he gave me this. Maybe you've, you've heard about this. And, and I see this a lot in, uh, in Facebook groups that they talk about this pill called low dose. I do, I do hear about it. I haven't tried it myself, but yeah, it is um, brought up a lot. Yeah. So yeah, so I took that low dose and from that moment on, uh, I could not really do anything anymore. My pupils were really dilated and there was no moisture anymore going into my eyes. And, and I wasn't, and I wasn't really digesting any, digesting anymore, anything anymore. That was like the worst thing that I could have possibly done to my health, taking that low dose pill. 
so I just laid in bed for uh, for I think it was months at a time uh, trying to drink as little as possible so that I don't have to go to the toilet uh, waiting for my stepdad to be home to give me some food and and then he, uh, he gave me a snack in the middle of the day. <laughs> that was actually pretty funny. He gave me, because I used to like carrots a lot. So he gave me every day uh, one package of carrots. And I just kept eating carrots all day. So I, I, I ate like uh, two pounds of carrots a day. And then I, my skin was also really orange. <laughs> I looked completely weird. <laughs> oh. and, uh, and then half a year later, uh, I was thinking to myself, that was my turning point. What is the point? Like, why is this thoughts that I have still in my mind? Why do I still have plans? I can't even open my eyes anymore. I can't stand up. And I just completely gave up. And that was the moment where I experienced, uh, for the first time, happiness at that bed and that, at that moment. Yeah. And I was so happy. And that was the point where uh, my health really started moving, st started turning. And then I spent, I lear I've learned to live without thoughts because it wasn't useful. And after one hour of no thoughts, I could get up, could open my eyes again. And I went for walks, five to 10 minutes walks, just after one hour of no thoughts. So that was the turning point uh, for me. So what was it? You know, how um, help me understand, help people watching understand, because it sounds like you were in a living hell, pretty much, um, you know, trapped in this severe illness. And then it, you said this is the point where you gave up. So what was it about that that brought on happiness for you? I always thought that, you know, I was, I've been my whole life trying to, I was busy trying to achieve something in the future. But at that moment, I didn't have a future anymore. All I had was that moment. So I completely surrendered to that moment, I think, not trying to achieve happiness in the future. That's how, that's, that's how I called it back then. And of course, that wasn't the end of the journey. Um, but completely surrendering to what is. And then I finally felt, you know, present in, in the room, in my body, and uh, not fighting this moment anymore. And, you know, the fight or flight mode is also just fighting reality. Mm -hmm. And I was fighting real reality in myself. I could not uh, comply with the, uh, the 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 assumptions that I had that I, how I had to behave, the uh, my self pressure, how I had to be, feel, or feeling guilty for not being able to uh, to comply with all these self images. And I think that was. Uh, ground groundbreaking because I found out that happiness was sort of giving up and being in the present moment. And I always thought that my happiness was somewhere else in the future. But it's so, it's so groundbreaking to realize that you don't have to do anything for it. So that was uh, initially the turning point. But I mean, I was far from ready right. back at that point. So <laughs> I, I don't want to say it's just giving up. It's not that easy. <laughs> I'm so glad you're sharing this, though, Daniel. I think it's such an important thing. And you know, it took me a long time to appreciate how powerful you know, our minds are and our thoughts are and the relation with our autonomic nervous system and our ability to heal and take care of ourselves. And I think it's easy to dismiss this stuff. So, uh, I, you know, I'm really glad you brought it up. And I think, you know, some of us resist embracing this part of this illness because it is such a serious illness and it feels like, or it can feel like it diminishes the severity of it somehow, what we're going through if we say that our thoughts, our mind can impact our physical health. And I don't think it's, uh, you know, um, everyone's got a bit of a different experience so there's different causes different things keeping us there but you know like i'm reading this uh, book right now about a guy who you know fractured his spine in eight different places and then he just did mental exercises every day to heal it and you know it's, people say well what if i use my mind to get better does that mean this was always just all in my mind but no just like this guy's spinal injury was not in his mind it, it just it shows that our thoughts and our minds are incredibly powerful and linked to our entire body. So it, it impacts the functioning of our entire body. To, to, to make it a little bit more visual, uh, I spent, uh, that was in 2017, I spent my day sitting at a park bench without any thoughts. And the more I sat in the park bench without any thoughts, the more I 
felt and picked up on other people's energies. And I, it, it, for me, it felt always like they were running as fast as possible from A to B. And this point in the middle was sort of um, an obstacle to overcome. And, you know, this obstacle in the middle is all we have. It's who we are. So if you then, if you, if you try to be something else that you're not, or trying to achieve something in the future, you're running away from what you are. And that is, again, the fight or flight mechanism. So it's all, it's all related somehow. But, uh, I mean, the, the, you know, you understand the, the Dan Neufer, uh, theory that I accepted a, a few, a few years ago from the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system. I feel like you're speaking directly to me. I just want to keep you here all day to keep teaching me more about this because you're you're addressing so many things that I still haven't <laughs> fixed in my life. Like I'm still running from A to B. I think a lot of the time um, I have it at the top of my, you know, my um, notes for the day, like my my plans. I just recently added, I am not in a rush. I am never in a rush because I noticed recently that I'm pretty much always just rushing to get things done, no matter what I'm doing. It seems to be mm. some trying to get somewhere that I am not currently, which is insane. <laughs> yeah, and I, and I have that, have, I have that too still. I still have to remind myself. And I made, I made sort of a deal with myself because I think that my, I, I, th I don't think that there is the sort of healing from chronic fatigue syndrome for me or, and, and, and being sick from chronic fatigue syndrome for me. But if I just apply the habits that I've, that I have, uh, well made up that work and i keep doing them i get better i get better and better and better but if i don't do it i get sick sick, sick more more sick because my body just doesn't want me to be stressed it doesn't want me yeah. to be in a rush like like i used to be so whenever i feel uh, rushed i'm gonna lay down and i'm gonna wait i'm gonna fall I'm, I'm trying to to fall asleep for an hour and then i wake up and i'm calm again and that that's just my habit now, right now. And for, so, yeah, because I wanted to try this out this year. Uh, and I was, I have, I had no fatigue for a very long time. And it was January 20, this, this year in 2021. So I wanted to see if I reverse my habits back, can I get chronic fatigue syndrome again? That was also partly because I'm, I was working with this recovery program on my website. And I wanted to tell people about how to deal with a crash, but I completely forgot <laughs> how it was to have a crash. <laughs> so I started working as crazy and I was like in a rush and I said, like, yeah, that's good. Let's be in a rush. Let's really try it out. Then uh, it took me uh, two weeks and I had like symptoms again. Uh, but then I was like, okay, that's not a crash yet. Let's go faster. Let's, let's push myself. Let's do more exercise. <laughs> so within two wow. months, I had a crash again and I felt like I, was, I felt terrible again. <laughs> right now my head is just like, I don't even know what's happening. Like you just purposely made yourself crash. I this, this, I've never heard this before. Yeah. Just to, so you could better understand what it was like and remember. And yes. Were you not scared that you might get stuck there or I, I don't, I just, I can't imagine, <laughs> I can't imagine ever doing that. Well, I felt so stupid afterwards <laughs> <laughs> and it, it was, the, it was ice here and it was very beautiful and I wanted to go speed skating again and I couldn't and, and I have to wait five years maybe to do that again. So, uh, but on the other hand, on the other hand, it made me see that every time I was a, a sort of it was not really rock bottom, but it was like in a crash. I could develop, I could like heal faster because I really know what to do. And that that that's been for me the whole purpose uh, behind crashing multiple times. How can I do it so you've done faster? The, yeah, you've done this multiple times. Yeah, well, well not purposely. Uh, like last year, okay. there was a death in the family, and uh, that made me emotionally. Okay. And then I crashed after a, after a month again. And I was also working with uh, journaling uh, one and a half, two years ago. And then all my anger came out because I, there was this, this, this Dr. Sarno theory. Maybe you have uh, learned about it. TMS, you have to journal every day about the things that you're angry. So I, I think journaling is also very important to, um, 
to to come become in, get in touch with the boundaries that we have because uh you know healing the emotions is one but if you then just continue your life so the same emotions get up all the time because you're not listening to yourself then it's sort of like uh well, how do you say this mopping the uh, in dutch we say mopping the floor uh when the tap is still leaking so it doesn't really matter uh if if you don't fix the the behavior with yourself and the respect that you have for yourself and the reasons behind the emotions and and sometimes the emotions are uh, unconscious you don't really feel them because you don't want to feel them but when you get writing about them it becomes easier to feel the emotions so uh, writing all the things that upset you like i start with curse words always like like you know very evil words and then i start writing everything that bothers me and then there was a bomb going off in my body uh, that released all the anger and i was trembling shivering sweating and that took like several weeks to uh, to 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 go through that process and then i wasn't again in a crash but from that moment on i realized and that sounded very weird but from that moment on i was in touch with who i really was and that was sort of another groundbreaking thing for me in in recovery. I love this. I'm a big fan of journaling. I journal religiously every single day and I have different approaches that I rotate through, but I've never done this with the anger and and my immediate thought is like, "Oh, I'm not angry, but we're all angry." Yeah. <laughs> we all have to be. Yeah, so yeah, that's I think that's a really a really good idea and a, just a nice focused way to work through it. I I have a lot of questions about, you know, more of the specifics of what your recovery looked like, but I'm curious always what the um attitude or understanding of illnesses like MECFS is in different countries. So what is it like in the Netherlands, like generally from doctors or just, you know, people in general? Do they know about this illness? What, what do they think about it? How do they treat it? There was, when I was really at my worst, there was this thing that I went to. Um, I just remembered now this uh, chronic pain and chronic fatigue clinic. And mm. a taxi driver had to pick me up and I went there three or four times. And then they they wanted to teach me things. Uh, like pacing, for example, that's where mm-hmm. I learned pa- uh, this pacing techniques. But then they dismissed me again they, because they've never, they had never seen someone in such a worse shape, and I was too tired to uh, to join their program. So, what did the rest of your recovery look like? You, you know, were there other aspects to it? Things that helped you to get where you are? Well, yeah, there there are so many. There are so many aspects mm-hmm. that that. That, that helped me maybe for one percent maybe for even half a percent and i call i just call them habits because i have to keep doing them mm-hmm. and so the the recovery program on my website is it's just all about implementing healthy habits but one thing that i uh, that i noticed is uh, because you know when i was so so severely ill and i uh, i like tropical beaches so i I visualized myself being on a tropical beach. So I went to this tropical beach uh, when I was a little bit better and I noticed my health just improving immediately. And then I came home and my health started declining again. So I spent a whole lot of time during recovery on tropical beaches. (laughs) (laughs) And that helped me. That sounds like a not terrible therapy. (laughs) Yeah, yes. And, And now I just advise people uh, just buy a hammock and go into the forest hang up the hammock i mean you can be tired everywhere you don't have to be in your bed so were there things aspects you know you talk about these habits that you built you know a lot of people had to do a lot of or some people have to do lifestyle medicine type changes you know look at their diet yeah i don't know toxins exercise things like that was any of that a part of your journey no, I, I always ate healthy. Mm. Um, and in the moments leading towards chronic fatigue syndrome, I had a digestion problem. Like I sort of had a diarrhea all the time. Mm-hmm. And I tried to improve my diet back then. And I did came across this man who told me to eat several small meals a day. But uh, that didn't really work out for me. And well, I, 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 I eat a mostly plant-based whole foods organic uh 
type of diet. And yeah, I don't want to make a big deal out of, uh, of diets. I come across people who are religiously following protocols and cleanses and they're so stressed about it. And yeah. they sometimes it looks to me that there is hardly any progress and I feel sorry for that. I tried it as well uh, because I just remember it's been so long ago. I tried as well this uh, this month without carbohydrates in the beginning of uh, recovery. <laughs> and that was a terrible because uh, I was not ready for that. And that made me uh, more tired. Okay. Yeah, it does seem very individual. It seems like there's some experimentation yeah. involved. Everyone's got to find their own path. I mean, typically, I don't think anyone's getting really healthy on like high sugar, high processed food diets. But, you know, once you kind of clean it up, specifically what that looks like seems to vary from person to person for sure. So it sounds like this journey has changed you a lot. And I, I remember reading um, on your website, I believe that that you are very glad this this is one of the best things that's ever happened to you. Am I am I quoting you correctly? Yes. Yeah. Which is I kind of get now, but it took me a long time to get there. I think that would be a tough thing for a lot of people to understand. So yeah, can you just tell us a bit about like, how has this changed you? How was this all this mm -hmm. suffering a good thing? And how did this lead you to you know your holistic health studies and everything that you're doing now? <laughs> okay, well, looking back to the old Daniel, um, I was always trying to find connection with other people. And I felt mm -hmm. like that was I didn't have enough money. So I was always you know, trying to, to find more money. Um, I, was, I, re I remember one day, just uh, a year before chronic fatigue syndrome, waking up and there was no thought in my head. Like, I was like, what? This is weird. Where are you guys? And then they came back, and zzz, you know, I was all the time, all the day like this, just brainwashed by all my thoughts. Always trying, you know, just from A to B. And when I look, if I look back to that Daniel, it feels like an ant to me, you know, this ants crawling and, you know, always working very hard, just trying to look like a computer or. And I'm so glad that that I that I got out of that, to, yeah, to be honest. Yeah. And I think that was a normal lifestyle. It's it's like moving from two dimensional to three dimensional, or from three dimensional to four dimensional. It's just adding something to to life, and it's not so dull and flat anymore. So when you say that you know this was such a great, I, I don't know your exact words, but that you're glad that this happened. Essentially, it sounds like that's why, because it completely change the way you live your life, the way you think, yeah. the way you behave. And I, I know that because I was always, you know, trying to, ach to achieve uh, connection more or less with other people. But instead mm -hmm. of that, I found a connection with myself and I feel centered now. I feel, I feel like I'm in my power now over my strength or how do you, however you want to call it. Um, and I have the urge to do much less. So I spend sometimes just whole days relaxing <laughs> and that's how I like it wow yeah I think I I need to hire you as some sort of coach or something I <laughs> oh I've got <laughs> I, <laughs> I'm just I'm so impressed with your everything you've taken away from all of this and with how it's changed you and just with how much insight you've gained and I just find you to be incredibly why well, I want to have you back every week I just I feel like you have s not a, I know you have so much to offer. I just, I'm, yeah, thank you for sharing all this. I'm just oh. I'm soaking it all up. So obviously this shifted your career, your focus, your passions, and you moved into, tell us a bit about what you're doing now and how that happened. Yeah, so in the, in, whenever I started to feel a little bit better, uh, I started reading everything. I wanted to know everything about all these topics uh, from holistic health, like it first started with mindfulness, being in the present moment. And then well, I just read so much and I, I, I try to as well look because you know, I, I don't see a point for people to go to study anymore because at universities, if whatever you want to learn, it's on their website. So you can access everything. And, and then you come across pro, 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 uh, like special, what do you call it? Professors? Professor? Like mm -hmm. professors and scientists and people who work on those theses. And then there's books about those subjects. And I just, for a time, I wanted to read every week uh, a book. 
about holistic health. And in the beginning, all the topics seemed like vague. Some was, for, for example, about hypnosis or uh, beliefs or uh, uh, anger or boundaries or, uh, well, all those topics, maybe frequencies. But in the end, after reading every week a book, <laughs> which was also a bit weird, I found that it's always, every book is the same, actually. It's all about one topic. And that is just like Dan Neufer said, is the, the parasympathetic nervous system or the sympathetic nervous system. Mm -hmm. So it's actually very, very, it started to get more simple over time, the more I read. So what exactly is it that you do now for work? Well, I, I last year I started coaching um, mm -hmm. based on donations. So people could just give whatever they, they wanted. But uh, I noticed that this wasn't really working for me or for them. Sometimes mm -hmm. people take things more serious when they uh, when they spend more money uh, on things. Mm -hmm. But I still wanted to help people for free. Uh, mm -hmm. But I don't want to give up my time for a conversation where people, uh, sometimes they just don't apply anything after a week. Or sometimes mm -hmm. I just felt like no, my time is not being appreciated. So I, I started working on... Uh, a recovery program from 13 modules which is totally uh, it's totally available for free on my website so it's it's uh, it's for donations uh, but I, the work is always going to be available for free and this is actually a very hard program to do because it's you really have to do work that is not easy trying to uh, to get calmer more in, in every part of your life and on top of that, you can book me for a coaching session, and that is for, uh, for a small fee, where I try to pick the biggest stressor in people's life and see what it is. So I ask them questions, and I hope always that they are going to cry in a conversation because we can suddenly name a, a stressor that has been hidden for so long. And I don't always mention, I, I don't always manage that, but uh, that's my biggest purpose for every conversation try the biggest to find the biggest stressor you, and, you uh, keep saying all these things that i'm like wow that's the first time i've heard that as well i've never heard someone who does coaching say my goal is to make you cry <laughs> I, I don't always say it. i don't always tell them <laughs> and uh and also the uh the coaching is also part of the uh, the program if, if people want and then they can just add have some some help uh, guidance with uh, the modules because not the models the modules are not easy it's it's not something simple and if if you don't have determination determination to go along with it or the faith that reducing stress will help you then i think giving up is uh, is likely wow i i think it's amazing that you put all so much of this out and you know so much of it for free i so many of us i don't know if you've noticed this as well but people who come through these things you just a lot of us come back with this drive or passion to just connect with other people because we get the struggling and it just it's like oh my goodness i made it through but there are so many people who are still in it um so yeah i just yeah i, I guess I, my rambling point is i thank you for all that you do there's such a need for this kind of support out there and i'm very intrigued i'm going to be this afternoon <laughs> looking at your modules and um I am probably going to take you up on the coaching. So I, I hope some other people will consider it oh, as wow. well, because I think you have a lot to offer uh, in terms of overall health and happiness. Uh, if people Thank want to find you or right reach you, where, where would they do that? Or how would people get in touch? Uh, um, well, maybe you can put the link to my website uh, beneath this video. Absolutely. Uh, it's my name, danielvanloosbroek.com. Okay. And from there, it all, uh, it all speaks for itself. And uh, oh, wait, I also have this YouTube channel. <laughs> oh so, yes any, yeah. any any other spaces so your youtube channel yeah. is that your name as well or where do people find that yeah it's just my name okay. and uh, i try to grow it but it's it's not really going fast and sometimes i just give up on it for like six months and then i think <laughs> oh, i should continue doing it and therefore i've got respect for what you're doing uh, regularly lots of videos and uh, and it's growing really well so yeah Oh yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's it, it is a lot of work, and in the uh, but it's it's grown to be incredibly fulfilling and rewarding. So it uh, drives me to keep doing it. But yeah, all this will be in thank the you. video description for sure for anyone who is looking to reach you. I could easily keep you here all day, um, but I will restrain. But maybe one day in the future we could do a follow up session because I really do think you have a lot to offer yeah. people who are 
who are facing these sorts of things. So uh, I'm looking forward to that. Thank you very much for this, uh, for this uh, opportunity for me. Oh, my thank goodness. You. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time and, and doing this, you know, for free and putting this out there. I, I really, really appreciate this. I'm so glad to have met you. I'm sure other people will be very glad to have, you know, to found you and hear a bit of what you have to share. So, yeah, thank you so much for doing this.